<laughs> That's how you know I wasn't here. When they say to you, you weren't here. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so that was something surprised I got for the last minute, so like that. Um, before we start anything, I, sometimes I, I feel, because it's a commercial, I feel like sort of doing it. That I thought I was thinking how to think a little bit. So I saw something which really irritated me. So it's totally off topic, but it's a brief point. I got it. I should just throw me a pen. I guess uh, black is best. Yeah, black. Blue, blue is the purple. No, that not that. Next blue. Blue. That blue is good. I just, I just saw, I saw this. <laughs> Sorry, can you guys throw me an eraser also? It's not to like a marsh here. This has just. Oh, you want black? No, no, it's good. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, that's all. That will be for tomorrow. Oh, this year. In any case. Um, so I saw this came out, a big picture that said, ooh, new studies have shown that marijuana smoking deposits four times as much tar in your lungs as tobacco smoking. So big picture here, here are the, here are the lungs, I'm not sure what they were, okay, like this, here's a picture that says tobacco, tobacco, here's like this big black lungs, four times as much. That says marijuana. Does it matter whether it's medicinal or not? <coughs> Why would it? Anyways, this is all it says. It says, oh, the implication is marijuana is four times worse to smoke than tobacco. Look at that. So that nasty picture is black lungs. So I rolled my eyes. It's ridiculous. And I was like, that is the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Why? No, ask you a question. Logic. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about advocating marijuana smoking. Why is that the most stupid picture in the world? Because it depends how much you smoke. Right. How many Obviously. cigarettes, you know, you smoke 10 packs a day versus exactly. a little bit of that. People smoke, when they smoke, tobacco smokers are smoking like 500 puffs a day or whatever, whatever it is, and marijuana smokers are smoking five puffs a day or whatever. So the point is, obviously, it may be more, but it's less. This is just typical bad. And bad depends how they smoke it. Sorry? It depends how the marijuana smoke. Is okay, that okay. Well, I've, I've heard this, but the point, yeah. okay, in, there I guess, many things, but so many factors. The point is, just because marijuana puts four times as much tar in your lungs, doesn't mean if you smoke marijuana, you're four times worse off than you smoke tobacco. That's, that's mm -hmm. So what, what erudite publication did you see that in? Well, I think it came out, I mean, the fact came out in some new study, but then the, the, the internet was a buzz. So there was a big anti-marijuana movement. Everything was brilliant, brilliant, you know, anti-marijuana propaganda. That just, shows, that just shows that uh, smokers uh, smoke more. Shows that? Uh, marijuana smokers uh, smoke more. That's why you the brownies. Good uh, awesome. Way, uh, it's good to hear us. Yeah. He's going to have a... I know, uh, Mary, I tell me on a state in California. Right. I'm, I'm irritated about that. I did I tell you because we have clients. We have, oh. we have, we have clients who supposedly were going to make marijuana oh. chocolate that was going to coat their ice cream bars. And they never. And then I, when I saw the, the Ben Jerry's I emailed my the banker charge. I was like, what happened, happened, happened to these guys? And he's like, they're all weed. <laughs> why did they get to the. They could have been in the. Okay, all that marijuana stuff aside, another topic. Um, <laughs> so you want to leave it out of the board? <laughs> um, look, I'm speaking against marijuana, as you can see. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, so, anyways, I hope our sheer. My experience is once we miss a day, then the sheer is also its falling apart. So, I hope we all unravel here. Um, we are. We're holding on Duff Vav Amanov near the bottom. We said the base is a house with a honey St. Kriyash. I'm eating is uh, bread for dinner with salt, and the Cohen standing on his shoulders is a Kriyash Mott. The Gimel is three camels in a ruin, the first carrying the line of the Dove, the second carrying Eliyahu Manavi, the third carrying Dove and Amalek. Dov Dalit is a door spanning from the Ula neighborhood to the Kotel with Dov and on top of it, in his Chassid uniform. And Dov Hay is revealed from the a Haystack, trying to stave away the wounded <coughs> man, and suffering terribly as he's getting poked by the needles from the hay. So now we're on Dov Vav. And just if you want to keep track of, that was mnemonic, but in terms of keeping track of the flow of the Gemara and the structure of the Gemara, at the very end of Dov and Mabes, we mentioned there's a mitzvah to say Krishma Lamita. We said it has some Sugul power, it staves off Mazikin and Yusurim. Then we basically spent the da talking about Yusurim, then went back 
to to uh, the on our top of our Abba and above, um, Mazikin. There were four statements that Abba and Yaman had said. One of them, the third of the four, was about Mazik in general, what they are. And he said, if you could see them, you wouldn't be able to survive psychologically, I said. In any case, so that, we had those four stories. And <coughs> the fourth of them, Abba and Yaman had said, was the place for tefillah is in a shul. So we're like segueing into like where Hashem's presence is, and we said Hashem is more receptive to tefillah in shul because it's a makarina, it's a drasha, a place of singing. And then we said, oh, speaking of Hashem being present, so how do you know Hashem is present? Like ten, three, two, one. And then we asked, want to know one, one, two, three, ten? Um, when we answered those, so that's kind of what we're up to about Hashem's presence and being around and Hashem being present with us. That's what we're up to. We ended with a question question mark, um, if you remember, we said that the ten people <coughs> for whom Hashem comes to be present with, and Shekhinah being there, were ten people in a minion. But three to one people were clearly, the issue was about learning the Torah. It was an emphasis, we said even with the, the three Dayanim, you might think they're doing the good for society, Shlomo Ba'alma, that wouldn't bring Shekhinah. But what they're doing is actually, like, you know, Torah live, and that is enough to bring the Shekhinah. And same with two, they're learning Torah together. It's written in the book of Zikronot, and one person is sitting learning Torah, Hashem is there. So, we we'll asked a question at the very end of Shir, wait a second. When the Gemara asked 1 to know 3, why, why do we need to know 10 as a separate Kiddush? So, what we would have liked it to say, perhaps, is, well, 3 for learning Torah, but the remaining of 10 for dying. But that's not what the Gemara said. The Gemara said, well, if there's 3, Hashem is there, but if there's 10, Hashem comes first and waits for them. So then we asked, well then, what's the relationship, this is like a punch, the question was, what is the relationship between Tfila and Shekhinah? Is the Shekhinah present when one Dobbins and less than a minion? I think most people would probably think you need a minion based on Skimara. I wasn't so sure, I thought about it. Five minutes after she was over, I went downstairs. One minute after she was over, I went downstairs. Within five minutes, I just asked my buddy in the basement just what he thought, like he didn't have an opinion, but as I was talking to him about it, it dawned on me that we actually saw in a Gemara we learned very recently a proof. It's in a Rashi, really. A proof that the Shekhinah comes <coughs> when, when even one person talks. What was what, what it dawned on me? I'm like embarrassed to say it, and it didn't come to me when we discussed it this year. The end of uh, one of Abba Yaman's statements um, was it's the, it's the last one on the Hay on the base, number two. He said, if two people dive in, and one guy doesn't wait for his friend when uh, yeah, he finishes right, right. first. Mm -hmm. And he thinks, well, you know, I'm done dopping, oh, I'm out of here. Right. Then he then he leaves his friend in the lurch, the friend is uncomfortable, messed up his kavana, and Hashem basically disregards that guy's prayer. And the <clears throat> proof text was basically, I'll speak loosely because the actual language is quite challenging, but basically Hashem says, you think I just came for you when you, when you leave, I leave? No, obviously not. I'm here for you and your friend equally. And... You know, I'm not, the Shekhinah is not leaving, that's, I'll read your Rosh in a second, just because you're leaving. So the implication is what? That when two guys dominate, even one person dominating, the Shekhinah is present. That's not the implication, it's explicit. I'll read you the, the Rashi. So, Rosh is bothered by the very challenging Pasuk itself. Because the Pasuk says, oh, no, I'll read it, it's three lines on the bottom line, 52. Tanya, Abba ben Yaman Omer, Shnaim shenich nasu palel, two people who go in to pray together, v'kadam echad mehem, one finishes before the other. This Palel in his prayer. Lo Himtin, sorry, Vilo Himtin, and the guy, the first guy who finishes davening, doesn't wait as Chavero for the second guy. The Yatza, and he leaves. Leaving, most understand, well, all understand, leaving him in an uncomfortable position because he's afraid, it's dangerous, he's all alone, and he's nervous, and therefore it messes up his tefillah. So then, Torfin Lo Tefilaso, Lepifanov, they up in heaven tear up the guy who finished first his prayer. Shanae Mark, as the Pasuk says, and this Pasuk is quite hard to, with the Jerusha, but anyways, it's Pasuk B.O., they're always difficult. Torev nafsho ba'apo, hey you, the guy whose prayer they tore in, your, in, your, in his face, nafsho is like his will, his prayer, in his face, ba'apo. Halaman cha te'azav aretz, you think, um, just because of you, halaman cha, because of you, when you're done davening, I, Hashem, leave the land, like, leave the Shekhinah, and that's what Rashi says, it's the last Rashi on Hayyam and Beis, if you look at yourself inside. 
Aisa, did you think, says Hashem rhetorically to the guy I finished early, Shem Bishvilcha, that it's only because of your account, Shit Yatsas that that you've now, you know, you, you, you're on the way out now, Tistalek Hashchina, that the Shechina goes to, the Shechina leaves. So of course the implication is the Shechina is there for one person, the last guy davening. So you see a guy davening, the Shechina is present. And just because you think you left, the Shechina is, is going to Tistalek, is going to go away, and, and like the Shechina would leave your friend davening without the Shechina there? No, of course not. The Shechina is present when, when, when he davens also, so you shouldn't be leaving. You should have covered for the Shechina. And perhaps actually you can keep that in mind for today's Gemara, there could be a separate issue there. In other words, the way I phrase it, the way Rashi says it, perhaps, is that in addition to being inconsiderate to your friend, because now he can't have Kavana because he's nervous looking over his shoulder, because there could be someone coming out to get him in the middle of nowhere. Um, but on top of that, there's an issue of like being present out of cover for the Shekhinah still being there. <coughs> there you leave, the Shekhinah's here. And so perhaps you see today there's an issue of, of being present for the Shekhinah. Well, that's the same thing hold true then in any minion if you left before everybody else was finished. The, the, the part about tearing up the... You could, and that, because of this was an issue, exactly. So if the issue is, like, the f- clear focus of the Gemara is, as the Mephorshim understand it, is that you're leaving your friend lurch. And, and because of that, Hashem disregards your prayer, because if you don't respect, you know, your prayer is no more than his prayer, so if you don't care about him, then I don't care about you, kind of thing. I, I'm just speaking out that there could be, and your point will take it now, that it could be there's a separate issue as Hashem's present, like, where are you going? Like, how you don't leave in the middle of that? So then, indeed, if, if that's the issue, so leaving in the middle would be considered bad as also, and there actually are, like, in McGillan, so they talk about the badness, the very badness, of leaving in the middle of the, well, like, say, if it's being read, and so on and so forth, because, like, you're, you abandon Hashem, uh, sort of actively. Yeah, so we'll talk more today about the <coughs> possibility of the need to be proactive in your being Kabbalah Pnei Shechina, as a merit and a, and a virtue and a requirement all to itself. In any case, so to answer the question, is the Shechina present when the person davens the Yechidas? I would say, clearly from Rashi, the answer is yes, and it's not a din of ten. So it's, I guess, either learning or davening, but for one person davening, the Shechina comes, one person learning, the Shechina comes, but if ten people are davening, uh, maybe learning too, I don't really know about that, then Hashem comes first and, and is present with in that, in that example, it doesn't matter where the davening is taking place, I mean, if it's in the shul or not in the shul. This is not in the shul. Not in the shul. Um, there's no mention of it being in the shul. It's a shul. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's what I was also... The, the way that, so I'm not sure. The way that the, like the, Shofar and the Machaber, they, they all are worried about you go to shul together, but it, and you leave the guy in the shul is like a dangerous place all by itself. It could be, now like we're building speculation, plus speculation here, it could be that the Shechina would come to a person anywhere, could be, I'll make the argument both ways, and it's just that we saw before, we saw after this, but we saw yesterday, that Hashem is present in the shul. And therefore, we said it proper. Abba Yom himself said, "Ain tefila shal adam nishmas elu beis akneses shenei mar So that tells you that if you're davening biyichidus, you should daven the shul. So it could. It's not clear if this was, let's call it practical. You want your prayer to be heard, so they went to the shul to daven, or if it's no, the shkina is only present there, and it wouldn't be. That's, or it would be better to dive into the Bikita so you can't get to the shul to dive at the same time as the minion. That we'll see in the more later on. It's a separate, it's a separate virtue all the time. That you should dive in. You're ideally, if you can't be in the shul, at least you should be dive with the seaboard from home at the same time. Because these things are all like, it's a little fuzzy. Because not our topic. The topic, the Gemara is not laying out the, the answer to our question. We have to sort of, you know, deduce it from what we see. But you definitely see the Shekhinah is present for one person. Nishmasu doesn't even necessarily say into a shul, that is an understanding. And that's about the negative Shulchan Rav Pasch, it's about talking about going to shul and leaving your friend there. But I guess that also could just be because, <coughs> like, if you're going to dab the then or your house, then there's no need to keep company for the guy because he's safe in his house. What is your dab when you're somewhere out there? Okay, just say that. Rabbi, the point yeah. is, if you've got two people that enter a shul to pray, and one of them leaves before the other one is finished, does that necessarily mean that there aren't eight other people there also? I mean, yeah, that was, yeah, no, it's, 
it's clear we're talking about that you're leaving them all alone. Okay. That's, that's for sure the point here. There's a bit of a focus, even the Machabah Ramah, if it's, if it's um, only in like out in the field where it's like dangerous, only at night where it's, you know, with a boogie and bad people are out there, or even in general, like there's, you know, being left alone is disconcerting, and that would have an impact on his ability to concentrate, and therefore he should keep him company. And I guess it could perhaps reflect on this, if there's an issue of, an independent issue of Hashem's presence stick around, so then, not really, then. So, like, the more I think about it, the more I just have a, like how obvious it is that the Shem is present. There's a din, there's a din, like a black and white din. If a person's on, like a, yeah, if there's a din, black and white, if a person's on Mishma Nazra, you're not allowed to sit, sit down and then dollar on the side. Why? Because the Shekhinah is there. That's a cover of the Shekhinah. That's a din. It's not about a Kavana for him. Even behind him. You can't sit down. You have to be standing up because the shekhinah is there. So you have to have nothing to do with nothing to do with location. That's a separate halacha. You should know. So if you're, if we, I don't know, if this chazar shot's happening, the guy didn't finish, the guy in front of you is dominating, there's other issue of walking in front of him. That's the mess up. I'm not talking about that. If you're sitting behind him, you dominate in the seven o'clock minute, there's the eight o'clock minute. If people are dominating in your dollar, almost you have to be standing up because of the shekhinah. So, yes, the shekhinah is there. Is it Shmona Israel? Shmona Israel. Shmona Israel. Shmona Israel. Because the rest of the Dabi can have soaked with Torah anyway. No, no, no. It's one Esrei. It's Yeah. In fact, maybe if we arrive from that, that it's more intense when a person's learning Torah than when a person's learning Torah because there's no one to stand up when people are learning Torah around you. But there is a Shmon Esrei. So, so if you're the alarming person, are you, are you not allowed to leave? But we haven't, we haven't even discussed if you're the third person. <laughs> only, the only thing we've seen black and white so far is... We, I question, maybe there's an issue of leaving the Shekhinah out of the cover of Shekhinah, but that's not the, that may be lurking as a separate issue, but that isn't the issue per se here. The issue per se here is you're leaving your friend in an uncomfortable position, and therefore you can't have Kavana, and therefore Shem says, well, you know, I don't play favorites. But that would mean, so if there's three guys, there's no problem, you know. If for some reason you end up walking into the shul, you're the only one walking in, should you wait until others come to start to have name, or? You know, if, if you miss the Mincha minion, for example, you're not sure where the next minion is, is it okay to daven by yourself in Shul? Is it both daven with eight other people? Or, I, don't think that, I, don't, I, don't any, I don't think there's any great model of davening by yourself or with eight other people. It's still by yourself. It's only once you get to nine other people that you have a minion. Yeah. One plus nine is ten, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so now, back inside our Gemara over here. Oh no. Okay. Um, so we had, on line twenty-five. I guess let me say on line twenty-two. Abba Ben Yaman said that Tefillah of Adam is only heard at the base Knesses. Then on line twenty-five, a new person. After four Abba Ben Yaman statements, we have Amar Rav and Bar Rav Ada Amar Yitzchak, and it seems that his name might have been Rav Ada. I'm sorry. Uh, Avin or Ravin, it's not clear. But in any case, you'll see one in a second. So his first sentence was, not only is Hashem present in the shul, and therefore you should daven there because it's a makam of Rina and Tefillah, but also Minayin that Hashem is in other places too. So once you have one statement on 25, line 25 of Amar Ravin bar Adam Rabbi Yitzchak, now what we're up to is on line 42, and again it's Amar Rav Avin, so that's like Ravin. Bar of Ada Amr Yitzchak. New story. Minayin, how do you know Shaykhaj Baruch Hu Maniach Tfilin? How do you know that Hashem wears Tfilin? Well, he does. Shnei Amar, the Patsik says, Nishba Hashem Biyamino Uvzroa Uzo. Hashem swears, swore with his um, right hand, and that's Biyamino, and Uvzroa Uzo, and with his the strength of his left, of his arm, something like that. So, now just to understand, the way that a, a shvua works when you take an oath, is you're supposed to swear holding the Dabr Shepikadusha, like a Sefer Torah would be typical of No, not handy, hold to fill So, Hashem is doing the same kind of thing. Hashem is swearing, and his oath is, he has to be holding like some sort of chayfet, some object. What's the chayfet he has? We'll see if the chayfet he has in the Torah and the tefillah. And we'll now make Russian to show how we see these are referring to those things. But the point is just to connect the dots. 
Hashem is swearing with something that's indicating it's something Hashem will prove the Hashem thing is the Torah and Tefillin. There's going to be a question in the Marsha, like why two? Let them pray with either the Sefer Torah, the swear, or with the Tefillin. So to that, the Marsha is going to be listening on us, saying that the Shavu is both Midas Chesed and Midas Adin. Midas Chesed is the Torah, which is on the right side, you'll see, and Midas Adin is the Tefillin, which is more on the left side, and both Midas are incorporated to the Shavu. If the question is why two, the answer is well, it's two minutes, not it's more and more. Than it. <coughs> does, he to, does he need a base stint to move out the list? <laughs> <laughs> so, so back, so back inside. So the Gemara here says that was the pasuk that you see he swears with these things. But who says that these things that he's swearing with Yamino and Zro Uzo refer, refer to Torah and Tefillin? The Yamino. The fact that he's wearing with his right, Zu Torah, that is the Torah, Shnei the Pasuk says, Mi Yamino Eish Das Lamo. From his Yamino, from his right hand, comes a fiery, I don't know, religion or something. Fiery Torah to his people. What right. line are we? Sorry? What line are we on? We are on line 40, 1, 2, 3. Okay. Very end of 43. Okay. So that's, so the question was, how do you see y- Yamino is Torah? Because it says, Mi Yamino Eshdaslamo, emerging from his right hand, so to speak, is the fiery Torah, the, the Eshdas, the fiery religion, whatever. Uvzro Uzo, the second part, how do you know that the strength of his arm is Tefillin? It was Tefillin, Shneemar, because the Pasuk says, Hashem owes the Amo Yitin, Hashem gave owes to his people. And owes the tefillin. How do you know that? Umenayin she tefillin owes him, the Israel, to chesiv, because the pasuk says, "Varau kol ame haaretz." That all the people will see, "Ki shem Hashem nikra elacha." That the shem Hashem's nikra elacha. That the Hashem's name is on you. The yiru mimeka and the yiru mimeka. They will be afraid of you. So you see that the that what they're seeing is Hashem's. Name on you, and that's your power. That's your power. Was the power, and the power is the tefillin, and that's Hashem's tefillin. The Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer, God, Eliezer, God, the Lomer, Elu tefillin shabarosh. These things that the name of Hashem is on you is a reference to tefillin shabarosh. While the rosh is supposed to hand, two basic possibilities that could be overlapping. One is that the most the name, the shin and the dalid, is on the shabarosh. Just have the yud on the hand. You know, for many years I thought that the just the side that the, the shin is obvious, the shin is on the bias, right? Right. Where's the dalit? So for many years I thought the dalit was like the, the knot. You know, like the and then there's two versions of the knot, there's like the the dalit, the three and knot, the and there's like the four square knot, if you're not talking right. Mm-hmm. So but it was a slap shot. I look, I I, like, I scratched my head over Mishamura many times, I realized I have to show you a picture, but to see it. But the dalit is the straps coming out of the knot. Crazy but true. It's crazy. It's unexpected. In other, in other words, if I understand it correctly, I hope what I'm saying is not like great solution. It was a great finish to me. But it's something like this. How do I draw this? And this is the. That's the. Are you with me? The cylinder of Rosh over here. Okay, the front of the guy's head. Right. So behind, there's like this either three or four. Doesn't matter. Okay. And then out of it is coming like one strap like this, one strap like that. Okay? And it's this. I should make it move another color. Do me a favor. Any color will do. Yeah, that's what it is. That's the color. Thank you. But this over here is the dumb. Yeah, believe it or not, which I found very surprising. But it's not this, which is important. Uh, I mean, we probably feel very guilty. It's just double dollar. Yeah. What? Maybe, maybe there's some meaning about the dollar shape not also being there, but the point is you don't have to feel inadequate because your catcher is <coughs> like this. Ashkenaz is a swear. <coughs> I think there's even two different persons. There's two different, different ones. Yeah. There's one, one dollar and double dollar. Yeah. That's double dollar. So, that's cool. Yeah, we're going to write Kaplan's book. That's Ashkenaz, and the dollar is. Uh, Spar? So he might mean, you know, Eric Mizrach, he might mean like. Um, What's the source for that? The I, it's in a mission where I, I, you could, when the mission describes it, he says, like, he has a thing, straps. And it's true, this, it's the Ritzuah, so it's the straps. And Ashkenaz has a dollar here, too. That's a separate, that's a separate. <coughs> then that's Anyways. supposed to be on the bone. This guy over here on goes on, the, on this on the bone. Go over here. Yeah, anyway, I stand to be corrected because it's so hard to believe, but, like, I would scratch my head and look and look and look. 
That's what it seems to be. This is the dog we're talking about, which is weird, but anyways, we're bringing it to attention. So the point is that there's two letters out of three on the show road. The other explanation, which I like more, and maybe it's overlaps with the same thing, is that there's a din that the shalyan is meant to be um, like a personal sign, and there's actually a din, you're supposed to cover it, right? It's supposed to be covered, you know, like under your shirt, so then it wouldn't be a sign for other people who are going to be fearing you because it's a private sign to you, not a public sign to the world. It could be that they overlap. That's why there's a cover on it? No. The reason why there's a cover on it is just because the practicality is going to get rubbed out because of your shirt. Because right? it, it has to be covered. This didn't have to be covered, it concealed away. It's important to know that. Like, that's, uh, like if you're diving, let's say you're diving with your chidus in your house, and you might just want to keep your arm, like you want to keep your sleeve rolled up. So you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't, like, you know, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't, like, like, you shouldn't dive like this. You should dive like this, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, to put the towels over it also? It's just covered. Okay. It's not to be covered. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be covered. Why am I saying you're this? Because you feel dumb doing it in by the shul, but you wouldn't feel dumb maybe. How, do we, it. how do we get on to tefillin from Shema? No, okay, so good question. So that we are, okay, so it's, it's going to become a little, I'll tell you the for sure technical step, but then there's always the question of how much is conceptual, how much is technical. The technical step is we have two statements, Amar Rav and Amar Vitzchak. So the first, or Rav Avin. So, I'm uh, sorry, Amar Rav and Bar Rav Adam Rav Yitzchak. So we had, that was the, he had the Minai, you know, 10, 3, 2, 1. That was coming off the Shemus only in the shul, your fields are heard over there. The Shem is present in the place too besides the shul. When people learn Torah, the Shem is present. When people are dominating, the dominating and all people are present. And then, he, by, the, like, no, Joel Paddles, by the way, that Rav Avin or, or Ravin, um, Rav Adam, Rav Yitzhak said something else too. The Shem wears tefillin. And we go on there. So it could be, if you want to take the minimalist view, it's like, there's no connection. Just like, Blood for tefillin. Once, once, we're, once we're talking about this memories of, of um, um, Rav Avin, um, Rav Adam, Rav Yitzhak, so we've mentioned this one too. It seems to me that we're like, you know, we're dancing around the issue of, like, I, made a, I think I made a mention, that maybe it's in the very first year or second year, and I said something like the Gemara doesn't discuss theology, and Moshe Avra got all uppity. So, so <laughs> I, I stick to what I say, but I said very little. If the Gemara does touch theology, it's right here. This is our daf. This is like, this is Davav and Dav Zayn, you'll see this like talking about Hashem, Hashem per se. Very rare turn of events. But I guess since we're talking about Shema Yisrael, we're talking about what Hashem is, it becomes relevant. You'll see it, it falls away. There's, there's, not, there's not, you know, this is a, to talk about Hashem and his middles and where it's filling, you know, see his names and kind of stuff, that's totally, highly uncommon Talmudic activity. It's nice timing that we just had this in the home. Right, 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 right. Very good, yeah. And what's written, what's written on his partial? Excuse me? What's written on his partial? Come on to that. Very good question. The Gemara's about to ask a very question. You're asking, you're asking good. You're asking good. So, anyway, so we're talking about Hashem and his presence and what he's about and like. It's interesting, that's how we segue in. All, all this coming from the Krishna Lamita, that was the beginning and launching point. So, again, we know where it's filmed because it says Hashem swears the Yemino Uzro Uzo, he wouldn't be holding something other than the Dabrash of Kedusha. The Yemino was the Torah. The Uzro Uzo is reference to its film because O is its film by the Jews, to launch of Rosh. That those tefillin that Hashem wears, Maksibu, what's written inside of them? There you go. Uh, worth noting a very strange idiom here, not very strange, but a peculiar idiom of Mari Alma, which means master of the universe. I mean, this isn't unique in terms of its appearance, but it's not the normal way. Normal way the Gemara refers to Hashem, I think it's probably called. Yeah, it would be called a Kach Baruch Hu, we're talking about him, and if we're talking about people talking to him, people usually talk about Rabban Shalom, that's probably the most common ways. Here, like, we're not talking about Kach Baruch or Rabban Shalom, we're talking about Mare Alma, the master of the universe. So, Marsha suggests that it's because, what does the tefillin attest to, if not, you're, you're attesting to Hashem's being the master of the universe, in the tefillin and the Shema, therefore, like, since we're, like, we're talking in that context, we'll talk about Hashem wearing tefillin also, what, is, what would the master of the universe need to wear tefillin for? Something like that. Because he's already the master of the universe, what do you need to attest to? So, Maksib, the who was written in his tefillin, Amarlei, Umi Kamcha Yisrael Ge'echad Ba'aretz. What's written in Hashem's tefillin is, who is like you, the Jewish people, a singular nation in the land, in the world. So, the Gemara says, wait, Omi Mishtav, Ve'ech, Kuchibrichu, see that's 
Kutchabrichel is normal talk again. When we mishta beach Kutchabrichel, what the Holy One blessed be, he, does he praise, uh, you know, himself, because that's what Tzfilin are, B'Shvachayu the Yisrael, by praising the Jewish people, that's a little strange, isn't it? More answers in, he sure does, that's exactly what Hashem prays, uh, uh, praises himself with. Tzfilin, as the Pasuk says, Es Hashem Heimarta, which is, um, you praise Hashem Hayom, Hashem Emircha. Hashem has like praised you today. So you see, it's like there's like a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, exactly right. Hashem praised us. We praise Him. That is therefore, in Hashem's tefillin is a mention of the specialness of the Jewish people. So the Jewish people, Hashem, so to speak, metaphorically, of course. This is interesting. This is like the first Rajma. I should just, I should have said this from the beginning. I'm not getting into it, but. Everyone goes out of their way to speak out. Of course, just this is just metaphorical. <coughs> obviously, Hashem doesn't really have an arm, doesn't wear its villain, literally, like, a pair of leather on his head. Obviously, but anyways, I'm not even getting. I'm just took that as obvious. But in any case, um, no hypothetical comment of Hashem. Hashem, so to speak, says, "Amor um, lehem kosh baruch liyisrael, atem asisuni chativa achas ba'olam." You made me like a, a singularly unique. Thing in the world, Vani, so I, in reciprocity to you, Esas Chem, I make you Chativa Achas Bolam, like a singularly unique entity in the, in the world. Atem, you, the Jews, Asisuni, Chativa Achas Bolam, you make me singularly unique. I know that's <coughs> not redundant, but that Chativa <coughs> means like some, a unique thing. Achas means like singular. So, like, unique and and, uh, and one. Let me clarify what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is not just semantics. Um, the word singular and the word unique are synonyms. Okay, but I don't mean it in that sense. Whenever it, to say unique means it's one of a kind. So, unique means one. Qua means it, like thing per se. So, unique. Unique means like the one and only. So that's why if you learn grammar and whatever at school, they'll tell you, like, you can't say very unique because that's redundant. <laughs> Everything very unique. Unique means very unique. I have, I have to disagree with that, just to like parenthetical, because things can be unique in degrees. Like, this, I object to very round being a redundant, because it's really, William Sapphire's still alive? I used to read his column every single week. You know, he had the squad squad. You know what I'm talking about? Anyway. Anyways, so, 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 um, very round or very unique aren't redundant to my view because, you know, like every person is unique because only one of each one of us in the world. But like some people are very unique individuals that are different in many ways as opposed to and so on and so forth. Same with round. Of course, theoretically everything's perfectly round. They're round, not round. But in real life, you can be like, you know, when we say round, Awful we, can all, we can also mean like a little bit elliptical. In any case, so when I say singularly unique. What I don't mean, what I don't mean is very unique. I don't mean that. Or unique times two, whatever. What I mean is there's two words here that are sort of like singular and unique. They're sort of synonymous. Chativa, which the Aruch explains it. I haven't read it on my memoir, maybe the two. It's like a unique thing. A uni unique thing. Chativa, a unique thing, like a noun that's unique. And achas means one, which is also, one is also synonymous with singular. So when I say singularly unique, I don't mean unique squared, I mean unique in its oneness. That's why I'm saying those words explain this. What makes Hashem so unique is the nature of his oneness. Yeah? He's a unique thing, and he's a unique thing because he's one. And Hashem also therefore makes us a unique thing. Every nation is there's only one Persian nation and another one Greek nation. But we are unique in our oneness. I, see, I said a lot of words, but the constant trying to get past him, and that's the Pshat the Gemara. So the Gemara says, "Atem asisuni chativa achas." You made me unique in my singularness. That's maybe a more clumsy but clear way to say it. Because the world shneimar, as it says, "Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokim Hashem Echad." We we declare Hashem is unique, but the word Echad doesn't mean unique. Echad means one, because Hashem is 
by King of Lovado, the, the, the depth of Echad in the Shema Yisrael is that there's nothing but Hashem. There's nothing but Hashem. Or everything is Hashem, there's nothing but Him, so He's like, He's the one and only. In fact, I see some, I've seen some nice, I like them, translations in English that translated the word Echad as one and only. But I think what they probably mean is one and only God. That's not what the, the depth of Shema Yisrael means, and certainly not in this context. In general, what Shema Yisrael means in its depth is the one and only meaning, because nothing there is else. nothing else. There is the only thing in all of existence is just Hashem. He's perfect oneness, and everything else is just an illusion. Not just one and only God as well. It's much more heavy. <laughs> and anyway, so we're, when we declare that Hashem is one and there's nothing in Vado, nothing but him, and then Brokshan Kavod, we're prepared to die for that because the reality is so real. We're declaring the world Hashem is not just unique, like everything is unique, but he's unique in his oneness. And so to the Jewish people, Hashem's response is every nation is unique, but Hashem responds, um, um, Baniya says, Chem Tivach is both. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Hashem makes us unique, singularly unique, unique or unique in our oneness. And as much as Shnei Mar, says, Yisrael, no one's like you, that already makes us unique. There's no one like the Persians also, there's no one like the Greeks also. But, going Echad Ba'aretz, a singular nation, not singular in terms of unique nation, but that we are unified as a single nation, and we have the of Arvus, and we have a sense of Kishcha Balevcha, and we are supposed to feel like an ex- that we're sharing, we're, sh- we're, yeah, we're in it. We're really an extension of a single super soul called Yisrael. That was our old, old grandfather called Yisrael. Good old, you know, Jacob and Yisrael. <laughs> and like we're all participants in his super soul. Right? We have our own, but we come back. We're all one like that. And many, I believe, many of the. I don't get off the topic here. This is the main implication, of course. But I believe the halacha is like, for example, the halacha of ribas. So this is the Isra take ribas from a Jew. So like, if you ask, the, I'm going to cut it short, I'm going to get the ribas now. If you cut it short and say, well, listen, does that mean there's something wrong with charging ribas? The answer is no, there's nothing wrong with charging interest. Like you, can charge, you can rent out skis, you can rent out you know, a car, why can't you rent out money? So the, the answer is, I'm sort of dumbing it down, it's contracting it is, yeah, but you don't do that, you don't, you don't charge your brother yeah. money, yeah. And this is your brother. Every Jew is like, it's just not something you do. Not because it's wrong, but it's not, the, not in, the, in the abstract, but it's wrong in terms of how family behaves themselves. And, th- and therefore, like, the point is that it reflects that the Jewish people are like, considered a family. They're meant to, meant to relate it to ourselves as a family. Every, all of us. Okay, so the Jewish... Was it in this year or in the Gemara share I discussed? It was in the, in the Mishnah share, you say. <laughs> and then in my Mishnah share, like, Last week we were discussing a point that um, that I took a class in the summer, and there was a, I'm cutting, I'm not doing a long story, very short, with a bunch of non-Jewish people, and they they couldn't get their head around the Jewish notion of that, like I feel like I feel a real oneness and connection to a Jew I don't know living in Timbuktu. So they, they couldn't get their head. What, they couldn't get their head around that, but the Jew, like they really didn't, they really were refusing to refusing to believe that that I felt no more affinity to a Jew I never met in another country with another you know national identity and another language than a Jew who's from my own hometown, from my own home country, because in their notion of identity and nationalism like. There's like us and them. Yeah. They couldn't. They could They refused to believe. They couldn't get their head around. And it was as much as I tried to convince them that they thought I was lying. They thought I was just lying. American pride. Is that? Yeah, but and every nation like has a pride. But I, we haven't like. Anyways, so the point is, the Jews are feel a sense of connection one to the other. You know, whose parents didn't watch the movie script and say, "Oh, Jewish, Jewish," just like their names roll by. Right. Like, said, Why they, right? So there's something like that. In any case, so the point here in the Gemara is only that. Hashem, the, the big picture is, Hashem in his tefillin is, is um, mentioning Mikam Chay Yisrael, who's like you, the Jews, great effort of arts, and the Gemara asks, well, why would Hashem praise himself, so to speak, with his, the Jewish people? And the answer is, in fact, does. There is a sort of like, you know, two way street relationship. And the, since we sort of make Hashem unique, declaring unique in his oneness, so Hashem also reciprocates by saying the Jewish people are also like oneness and they're unique in the world, and I hold them special. 
that's the one. So, okay, now that's all fine and good, but the problem is in Tefillin, there are four Tefillin Sharosh, there are four boxes, four button. So this is one pasuk many, you need a few more, right? So the Gemara says, you know, that's it's fine. Um, for one, I'm a layer of, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm a layer of Acha Bre Durava, the Ravashi. On the second line up, I'm line uh, 52 at the bottom there. So, Tenach Bacha Beza, that's fine for one bias, you know, for one compartment in Tefillin, of the Shal Rosh, there's four compartments. But Bashar Bate Mai, what's in the other, what are the other compartments? You know, we need more Psukim. So, I'll read the Psukim there. So what's the other Psukim? So it says, with all this, there's plenty. I'll start reading it to you. So, <clears throat> Amr Lay, he says, look, first of all, you have Kimiko uh, Gadola, Sher Lo Elohim, Krovim Love. I'm not reading the Pasuk, but the more just read the first few lines, but I want to set the Pasuk because you'll see why, so you understand them. So the first Pasuk, that's not the first additional Pasuk in Hashem's Tefillin is Kimi Goy Gadol, Asher Lo Elohim, Krovim Love. Like, who is this great nation that Hashem has a special affinity to? Um, and then the next pasuk is that Hashem has a tefillin is umi goy gadol asher lo chukim mishpatim tzadikim kachol the Torah hazos who is the special nation that has the name of the Torah and then the halachas the righteous laws whatever it is asher no kinosim of nechem mayom that I put before you today those two pesukim are back to back I should point out to you the two pesukim in order one after the other um, and in addition you have another pasuk asherachi Israel you know you're fortunate the Jews mi kamocha am nosha b'ashem who is can be compared to who is like you, which are the nations like you, that saved by Hashem saves you. Mug and Ezrecha, like Ezrecha, Hashem is your like shield. Asher of Gavasecha, and he's like your, Hashem is your sort of pride, etc. Meaning that, that other nations need swords and shields, but Hashem does it for us, if you will. And you have another Pasuk, oh, Inasa uh, Elohim, has any other Hashem ever gone in and taken a nation out of another nation? So you see here Hashem took a special interest in us. And you have another Pasuk, but, um, which is uh, Hashem put you, placed you as, you know, supreme above other nations, as Sher Asa, Ferris to make, for the sake of us being uh, praise and, you know, whatever, and glory, etc. So the words, whoa, 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 whoa. That's, that's a lot of sukkah. We only needed four altogether. He's gone on and on and on. That's too many. You count there's actually this is five plus one more. Well, what so, about the revelation at Har Sinai? I mean, did you ever do that any other nation? Well, they, that, that well, okay, that's a good point. But that's, the pasuk is just the pasuk. The pasuk is well, okay. I can't speculate. Count it actually. What, what, why these are the sukkim as opposed to the other pasuk? But that pasuk is. So the Gemara is saying those are the Pesukim that are inside, but if you have one before and you have five more, you got too many. So that's what the Gemara says here. The Gemara says, Iyaki, wait a second. If that's, you tell me there's all those Pesukim there, then the Fisha Lutuvi Bati, you need too many boxes, you know, too many houses in the, in the Tefillin. Ella, so the Gemara just resolves it by saying, no. The first Pesuk of, of uh, Kimi Goy Gadol, and also the second Pesuk of Mi Goy Gadol, which are Taka back to back, those are just talking about um, <coughs> those don't want the, the greatness of the Jewish people in terms of what they have, their special Torah, and so on. So that's one praise. The Damian, the Hadari, since they're similar one to the other, the Chad basically go in one, the two Pesukim back to back, go in one compartment. Ashrafi Yisrael, you know, you're so fortunate that you have a Shem to wage your wars and not need, like, you know, sort of chill like other nations. Umikam Chai Yisrael, and the Pasuk of the Jews are unlike other nations. That they have a Torah that focuses on the uniqueness of the Jewish people relative to other nations. So Bachat Beis, so that's one theme, so one pocket, one pouch. And Oh Hinas Elohim and Hashem lift up one nation, Bachat Beisa, and Ulaseska Elion Bachat Beisa. And the final one of, of like the uniqueness of Hashem taking interest in us is the third, and the fourth is that we're placed above other nations is the fourth. So th th that's how we resolve it by lumping. The ones that are coming together. So we're seeing, by the way, just see, they're taking it very seriously. They're taking it, this, this Hashem having tefillin, being like they're telling you exactly what's inside. The before she's going to be worried about the order of them, kind of like that. I'll leave that for me for now. Anyways, the Kulu, and all of these Sokya that we have, we're in the page here, Ksibi, Ba'andre, 
they are also written not just for Sukkot when it's in his shell rose, but also on his shell yad. So, Mephorsh asked, like, like, what's the point of that? So some understand, because, like, of course, so at least one, Marshall, for example, explained those to get the one explanation, that you might have thought, like, we're only, because we're talking about Uzo, that Hashem only wears tefillin shel rosh, but doesn't wear tefillin shel, shel yad, so here you see, no, Hashem wears tefillin shel yad also. Whatever the implications of that are, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, that's the more to say. Tov. Very good. Is it the Pusik that we're learning out that Hashem was filmed from the Pusik of the arm? So it says arm, no? Oz? Vizro, Uzo. The Pusik itself says arm. The arm is strength. The strength of his arm. So, okay, so, yeah, so here's a, yeah, you're asking a good question. It's a good question. The question is if the Pusik that we started from is that Shem squares with his Yamino and Uzro, Uzo, his like powerful other arm, and then we're which it seems to be the right hand anymore. But no, the left. No, Oz is a. Oz is a. Uh, is, uh, so, okay, well, so what the Gemara said, Oz refers to Tefillin. Period. How do you know that? Because it says it's our Oz when they see, when they go and see us, and they'll have fear us, because our Hashem's name is on us, that's the Shal Rosh. Well, the Israel that's the Shal Rosh. So, Oz means Tefillin Shal Rosh. Shal Rosh. As far as the Zeroa issue and the Yamino issue, so there I said, like the Marsha, that, that he's, the, like the, the deeper here issue is when Hashem swears, he's swearing with his Midas Chesed on the right, Midas Adin on the left. So the, there the Zeroa is a reference to the Midas Adin, not to the Tefillin. It's the Uzo that the Tefillin, I, I, like the Tefillin, but the actual O's that we learn out from the Tefillin to Rosh, so therefore we're saying that we don't mean only Rosh. In other words, I guess if you, the Havamina, maybe, this is something very speculative, but the Havamina would be that he, before we, if the, the answer that Marsha gives is, oh, he wears tefillin shal yad, also, the Havamina would be that he's holding in his left hand the tefillin shal rosh to make a shua, so, so to speak. And his right hand is holding the Sefer Torah, and, and his left hand is holding the tefillin shal rosh, that's the os, that he's swearing by. Some way, I mean, it's like, of course, speaking, it's, like, it's metaphorical and speculative, so it's like, very, very you know, hard to know exactly. Nothing concrete to really log on to. But in any case, that's, I hope that answers your question. Um, Tell me, other questions before we move on? There's a, like even the Rajah, and so on, like the Rishonim all feel compelled, everyone to, to start explaining this tomorrow, because I think, without getting into this too much now, if I don't really want to, the Rambam, who might have been controversial on this day, we talked about that not long ago, like has won the day. The Rambam's a king. The Rambam is the Rambam is more or less the Shkafik king of you know, he won. The Rambam won, he got his way, and the Shulchan Aruch is basically patterned after him, and our thinking is largely patterned after him, and our modern enlightened society is really, you know, enlightened society is really patterned after him. Let's say you don't read more and more and more. Okay, wait, fine. I mean, but the, in general, he's like, he, 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 he won. You know, he had the tractors, they fall aside. People love the Rambam, and he really is. Worldview is very rational, and we like that, and it appeals to us. Um, I mentioned the Grab, who like, jumped up and down about the issue of not, the cult of not being real. In any case, um, so the Rambam says, and we like to take it as a no brainer, that Hashem has no body and has no goof and via and has no form, it's totally abstract. Like, that's, everyone knows that, no one question. You should know, you should just know that the ride that jumps up and down there and says, people a lot bigger than you, Mr. Rambam, have, have said, have taken things, have understood Hashem to be like more, I don't know what they thought, I, I don't know about that, but more corporeal than just, than you're suggesting. The Rambam's suggestion is that the, the Hashem is, like what you think it is, what I think it is, which is like, Hashem is totally, utterly abstract, because those are not real, I just mean, there's nothing physical about him at all. He's not even spiritual, just whatever he is, he is. Like we would never think otherwise, and that's how to codify and the call and everyone. It's straightforward. But but I'm just saying because of that, and because this and maybe in the, in the mind of many people of yesteryear, like they weren't sure how to take these Gemaras, all the Roshonim feel compelled, especially whatever all the Roshonim basically feel compelled to sort of deal with this issue of it being just, you know, metaphorical and, and memorializing Hashem, who doesn't of course really have a head. And no one the rabbi didn't mean to suggest that good Jews thought Hashem had a head. They just, they just, the wrong description would be totally, totally, totally beyond space and time and have nothing. 
was like, I don't know, the Torah is it's not clear like that. The Torah, if you read the Torah, it doesn't, the Rambam says he had actual metaphors, but the Torah is talking about Hashem's arm and Hashem's anger and Hashem's nose flaring up. So like, so I guess many people took that. Too little. Yeah, literally, on some level, literally. I don't know what, I don't know what exactly they imagined. But, you know, if, if you see, it, when you see a picture of an angel with wings, you don't think, God, that's blasphemous. Because, like, the Navi talks about wings on angels. Even though we know they don't really have wings, maybe they have something analogous to wings. So, whatever that means, I'm not I'm saying, you wouldn't look at a picture of angels and think, like, wow, how dare they put wings? I mean, they have crew in the, and they have wings, they have wings somehow, metaphorically, whatever they so like you would think, okay, so Shem has a nose and Shem has a head and Shem has a tilling, but the Ram says, no, 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 it's not the same thing. Shem has not, nothing about Shem as all is like nose-like or head-like at all, period. There's nothing of resemblance of that. And like if anything, many will explain today, I don't know if they're all meant or didn't mean it, that the only reason that, that we have a nose to understand what Shem's nose-like thing is, if you know what I mean, because Shem is so abstract, but it's totally abstract. What's my point? My point is, all that we're showing them on this camera spent a lot of time discussing that it's just metaphorical. And don't take it literally, Hashem is not sitting up on a cloud to fill them up. It's a little bit bad. Okay, anyways, sorry, but I'm not going to that because I. Like, we're not allowed to. That's think. a battle of yesteryear. We're what? not allowed to. Think yeah, for sure, I'm allowed to think that. But I'm just saying that's like that. that no, no, it's not a concern. So, what would be the reason why the camera talks about this type of thing anyway, even if it's so. Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, well, because you see, because Hashem, you see, this is indicating the relationship of Hashem to Jewish people. So it's very it's, it's intertwined here, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, the after quote, I think it's a mystical, but there's a Zohar that says, loosely speaking, Yisrael, Kashi Brief, Lorai, So, like, you know, it's not an exact quote, I don't think it's an exact quote. There's a, there's a notion of, like, Hashem's praise us, and we're his, like, Chutiba Achas, and his, we are Ma'am, we are him, and he's Ma'am, we are us. It was, we say in Rosh Hashanah, for example, like, you know? So that, that, that's useful to know and true. So we're more or less discussing it. But you see, there's a move, which I do not have, I'm not privy to, but I'm sure, I'm just, without knowing, I, I'm, I'm certain that uh, that um, Kabbalistic text, which I've not seen, I don't know about it, like they will, these Pesokians are indicative of Hashem's and what he's doing in their country. Because I see even like in Marsha and others, they're worried about like the ordering of these Pesokians. So you see that like, they're, Something's very specific happening here, and it's indicative of Hashem's Hanhaga, but I, um, that stuff is beyond me. But like I told you when I started today, if there is talk of theology in the, in the Shas, it's like heavily dominated by these, these, these next to today. I guess we're going to stop over here. So, okay. Well, it's basically nice in the book that um, the Gagoyim will look at you and be afraid to see Hashem's name on you. So there's, a, there's a, the Chavetz Chaim wrote, his day, which is also not our fight anymore. He said, if you walk in the street and a person, you know, says like, oh, hey, Jid, or whatever it is, and he, and he like, insults you, it's because he's not seeing the shame, which somehow he's not seeing the shame of Hashem, and if you would if you be embodying, like, Hashem, as you ought to be, they would be, they would be inhibited from doing such things. Interesting, they said. Yeah. Do you think that would hold down what's happening in Europe? Yeah, for sure, it would hold down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Since happening in Europe, there these guys are going around in Akiva and different parts of Europe. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I didn't really do it. Yeah. They were going all around Europe and yeah. people are spitting yeah, out the person. Person. Yeah, they were cursing, yeah. And they're yeah. videotaping a hidden camera. Wow. I saw one. Like, yeah, there was one they just did for all different cities. Wow. There was a journalist walking around yeah. Israel with a cross. Yes. Right. You see that one? Too? Yes, yes. So that was the counter. Yeah, that yeah right, right, right. To show that you hear their well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They did one the other day. Rome.